On today's programme, we have William Bust, author of Intentional Mastery, Step Beyond the Expertise and Build Better Business. William enables business owners to become the masters of their markets, operate more efficiently and stand out from all of their competitors with a strategic focus that William has on building better business every day. So William knows that if he asks the right questions, and if you ask the right questions, you get more effective decisions as a result of those questions. So that then allows you to unlock blocks and barriers. So we're going to be talking today about how to build better business. And I know you're really going to enjoy this conversation. Happy listening. For those of you who haven't listened to my intro, William is a speaker, business mentor, and author of Intentional Mastery, Step Beyond Your Expertise and Build Better Business. He enables business owners to become masters of their markets by operating more efficiently and helping them to stand out from their competitors, which I'm sure all of us want to do. Today, I'm going to be speaking to William about how to build a better business. So welcome, William. And welcome, Hakeem. Thank you very much. A great introduction. Thank you. Appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Thanks for coming on. So just tell us a bit, as I always do with all my guests, just a bit about your journey from where you where you started to becoming a business mentor. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I started uh, a career in insurance in the well, 1980s, a long time ago now. And uh, I was in the insurance industry until the early 2000s. And while I was there, I was in working with building teams and running big projects and managing lots of people. And it was, in a lot of ways, a bit like running a business. And I realized that one of the things I really enjoyed was the one-to-one support I could give people in the team. And that's why I left the insurance industry and set up my own business, because I wanted to do more of that kind of work, of using my experience and the skills I'd developed and honed to help other business owners to run a business exactly how they anticipated they would when they set it up. But quite often they were frustrated by things that they hadn't expected. You know, maybe they hadn't realized quite how much time they needed to put into the other parts of the business from that which they do. You know, we all, we're all good at some things and have to do the others. You may be a good with numbers. Or you might and not be good at marketing, or you may be good at marketing and not good with the finance. So, what I help people to do is to think about where to put their effort and how to bring the skills around them that they need to run a really successful business, the business that they thought they were going to set up when they started it. And what's what's the biggest things that you see are surprises to those businesses? Because obviously, yeah, putting them on the straight and narrow. Um, what are those things that? You know, when you go in, the, a common thing where you think, oh, right, yeah, this, this is something that happens all the time. Well, I think most people, uh, you know, built experience of the, the part of what they do that they really enjoy. And they've got, you know, depth of understanding. If you're, um, you know, if you are a marketeer, to use that as an example, you understand the marketing parts of the business. But that doesn't make you a great salesman necessarily. It doesn't make you good at product design necessarily so there are all these other aspects of running a business that people have to learn and quite often when they start the business they're confident that they'll be able to to work it out and i'm sure they can work it out but it might prove to be more difficult or have some subtlety they weren't really aware of and also they want to spend time doing the thing that they really enjoy doing the thing that they're good at and so part of what I'm helping them to think through is how do you design the business to give me the maximum amount of time doing the thing I enjoy and less of the time doing the things that I find difficult or a little bit harder. So, you know, using me as an example, Hakeem, you know, I really enjoy that one-to-one work with, with clients and helping them, talking to them, questioning, seeing where my experience can bring some value. And, to do that, I have to do marketing, I have to do sales, I have to do accounting, VAT returns, all of those other things. So I'm designing the business so that I can spend as much time as possible one-to-one with clients and using people for whom the accounting, the VAT returns is their bread and butter to do that part for me. 
Um, and that's all about designing the business. Sometimes, you know, you can't, you don't have enough cash in the business yet to be able to take on employees to do that work. But you can maybe think about outsourcing some of it to suppliers or coming up with a, a deal that's beneficial to both of you that helps you both develop the businesses you want. So that's the kind of areas that I'm looking at in terms of helping people to master, be the very best they can be at the thing they're really good at, but also master the business skills that they need to manage the other work. Okay, and, and, and that's what you mean, I, I, I'm i assuming, when you talk about trying to design a business that's more aligned or create a company that's more aligned with the specific purpose of that person set the business up to achieve. Exactly. And, you know, that's why I talk about alignment a lot and alignment with purpose. And I, you know, really encourage your listeners, if, if they're not 100% clear on why they're running the business they're running, is to spend some time thinking about that and really reconnect with what is it that drives them? What change do they want to see in the world or in themselves or in their local community? You know, it depends what the business is about. I, I worked last year with a training company, and a lot of what they do is about bringing information and knowledge to to businesses. But they part of the reason they do it is because it allows them to build the financial reserves to bring knowledge and skills to more disadvantaged people. So they're working in Bangladesh, building floating classrooms for the kids in the rainy season there and they're doing work in South Africa and some of the townships to help improve the knowledge and skills that young people have to avoid getting dragged into the gangs and the gang culture. So, you know, those are important parts of the work they do are about those bigger ambitions that they have. And I think that's, you know, something that uh, if more businesses were doing that, we could we can make a real difference to the way the world works, and that that's important for me too. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting point actually because it's, I think it's critical for people to keep the purpose. And I think, as you said, people go into it for the, with the right idea, they have a purpose, and then they get bogged down with the stuff that they don't like, um, and then it just becomes about the grind or making the money rather, and they, and they lose the purpose and therefore lose the complete enjoyment of what they do. So how so how do you go around? Um, getting them back on track and ensuring that that purpose stays front and centre of everything they do? So, I mean, the first thing to do is to reconnect with that purpose, and that that's about helping people to think through all of the reasons they set out to run the business in the first place. So I tends to be the first part of any engagement with me, but I work with the business owner, um, spend you know, a day or so with them, just really reconnecting with that underlying purpose, but also testing and checking with them that the experience of running the business hasn't changed that purpose, but it quite often does. You know, my original purpose when I set up the business was to support other insurance related businesses. That's changed over time because I've realized what I'm doing, this work on intentional mastery is applicable to a, a, a wider audience of different styles of business but actually a narrower audience of business owners rather than before when I first set it up I was working with business leaders in various guises managers and and supervisors and so on and I I've realized that my purpose is best served by really focusing on the owners of the business and the people who have that controlling influence who can make the big difference so that's where I focus now although I've broadened the uh, scope of the businesses that I work with, if that makes sense. So your purpose can change, but underneath it all, my primary purpose is about helping people to build that better business that's going to give them more joy, more time to do the things that they really want to do, and more value to their customers and clients. Yeah, thanks. Really, really useful to to just uh, get an understanding of that. And I think I think anyone who's watching this or listening to this, I think that is the first step. Whatever situation you're in, is, I think you've good advice, reconnecting with your purpose and making sure that that you remember the reasons why you started the business and that you're still doing those things. Or, as you said, if it has changed, what, what has it changed? And, then, and it's almost like restating what your purpose is to make sure that you're always focusing on that purpose. So one thing you, you mentioned there, William, was you know intentional mastery and focusing on intentional mastery. And that's obviously the name of your book. So 
you know, what was the reason for that name and what does actually mastery mean? Because uh, it probably means different things to different people. Yeah, it, it does. And I have a very specific meaning in the context of the book and the work that I'm doing. So I, in studying uh, the way that businesses develop and the, the differences between uh, successful businesses and those that are, you know, good but not great and those that are perhaps struggling a bit more, I started to think about what's the journey that we've all been on, you know, and, and perhaps we will all be on for most of our lives in connection with running a business. And it, you know, when we first start, when I first went in the insurance industry, I knew nothing about insurance. I had to learn it all. I was looking for knowledge. I was exploring. And that's what I call the first stage of this journey, explorers. Explorers become novices. Novices have got some knowledge, but they're still making lots of mistakes. I'm sure there are plenty of things we all do in our lives where we're still novices. You know, I can press a few keys on a piano, but I'm definitely a novice when it comes <laughs> to playing it. Novices become practitioners as they develop the skills, as they hone the skill and make it more, you know, unconsciously competent. They become the practitioners. And a, a lot of us are practitioners all our lives. You know, that's all we need to be in terms of work, that we go to work as an employee, do our job, do it well, get paid for that. And that's what we need to work for. But for some people, the underlying thing that they're doing is something they want to even take even further than just being a practitioner. So they will use their experience, build on their experience and become an expert in their, in their area. And I'm, I'm sure we all know lots of experts. Still haven't got to mastery though. There are a few who look at where they've got to with all that expertise and start thinking about how can I take that even further? How can I go beyond that expertise? And that, to me, is about that step to mastery is, is about a number of aspects that we have to go through if you want to, to take that step. The first of those is that most experts are really, really good at something quite narrow and small, but not necessarily good at understanding what they do. It's become so ingrained in the way they are as an individual. It's, completely unconsciously competent you know that thing we drive the car uh, yeah. you get home and you, you kind of get out of the car and think i don't really remember much of the journey um and that's you know that's a sign of expertise but a master will want to pass on that expertise they want to to teach others and part of that then is about making that conscious again really understanding what is it that I know? What is it that I've got a skill in? What has all my experience taught me? And not just experience of being a business mentor or being a marketing coach or whatever your role in life is, but all the other things that you've done in your life as well start to come to mean something in the context of what you do. Because I think mastery is about your identity, about who you are, as much as it is about what you do. So, you know, I love photography. I've been a photographer for 40 years. Uh, some of my uh, photography, you know, has been sold commercially. So I'm probably getting, you know, some certainly practitioner, maybe a bit expert in some areas. But I, I'm not teaching others yet. Well, that's, you know, part of that journey. I, start, I am, you know, using the experience of photography in the business mentoring I do because I'm, helping people to give it, get a new perspective. I'm um, thinking about what needs to be in the frame, what's in their picture of their business. How's that working from an exposure point of view? You know, there's a lot of things about light and darkness and exposure that it, have got similarities with the way that we talk about marketing and how we get the business known in the world. And, you know, if you paint a great picture with a camera, that tells a story or you paint a great picture with your words and your website in a business, you, you're going to be effective at getting that story across. So for me, that mastery is about bringing all of your experience to bear on the thing that you do and being able to simplify it and explain it to others so that they can start that journey and learn as well and, and have the value from it. But if you want to do that, to move from being an expert to a master, you have to start being intentional about that desire to make the change. You have to be 
consciously saying, I know I'm really good at, fill in the gap, you know, being a business mentor, but what is it that I do as a business mentor that other people value? And how can I simplify that and explain it? So for me, when I asked that question of myself, I went to my clients and said, what is it you really value from the work that we do together? And their response amongst many, but the kind of common features were around that I asked great questions, that I asked questions that made people really contemplate and think about their business in a new way. And I gave them that new perspective on their business and the new motivation, new encouragement to take it to where they wanted to go. So I started to work on, okay, if I, if, if I ask great questions, how do I do that? What is it I'm doing well, creates a great question? And that took me three or four years to answer that, that point. You know, I read a lot. I started, read books like uh, A More Beautiful Question, which is a fabulous book, uh, which I'd recommend to anybody. And I studied the work of Nancy Klein, uh, More Time to Think, and thinking about what are thinking environments and when do people do their best thinking. So, you know, a lot of time spent developing me as an individual in order to master this business mentoring thing. And it's, you know, it's something I will continue to keep doing because it's not, mastery isn't a destination. It's a way of life, uh, if you like. I'm always very interested in how people pass on knowledge. Um, and and I, I come traditionally from a, a sales and marketing background. Um, and I found very early on in my career, there's people who are brilliant at what they did. So as you described, and probably experts. But they, but they were terrible and horrible at being coaches or trying to enable teams. And we see this. I mean, I'm, I'm a big football fan, and you see this in football all the time where they get a player who was possibly one of the best players ever. They become a manager, but they seem completely incapable of being masters and then passing on that knowledge, um, which is which I always find quite interesting because what. Just going back to what you said, you said it's about trying to trying to be conscious is the first thing and being intentional, uh, and then trying to learn, try to understand. And I think they do try to do that, but there seems to be some block. Uh, so I suppose my question is, even when you're trying to be intentional, what are the challenges uh, within that? Because I, I see it, especially in sports, you see it where somebody's desperate, they've done the coaching badges, they've done everything they should do, but they're still just terrible. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that we're 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 speaking just. And the weekend has just gone where uh, two premiership managers have lost their jobs. Yeah. In, you know, quite different circumstances in many ways. But nevertheless, there's, there's a lot in what you say about that ability to take something that you do and then teach it to others. And, you know, another example from, from premiership football, um, you know, I think some of the best coaches, we could argue, you know, Klopp, um, Guardiola, whoever, you know, there's a whole Ten Hag at Manchester United. You know, are they the best in the world? Were they the best players when they played? No, not at all. They didn't need to be the best players to become the best coaches. Mm. What they needed to be able to do was to understand the game and use their experience as a player, which doesn't have to have been at the best at that level, to, to be able then to coach others. And I think it's a it's a really visual example when you look across the premiership of, you know, who are the best coaches. You know, and you look at the top of the premiership now and you've got Arteta who, you know, had a career at Manchester City and was a assistant manager under Pep Guardiola, now beating Pep Guardiola at his own game. And that's quite <laughs> an interesting, interesting uh, situation. So I think the sport analogy is a good one. And I think it gives encouragement to us all in business that, you know, we don't have to have been the best salesman. We don't have to have been the best coach. We don't have to have been, you know, um, executive coach or whatever. We don't have to have been the best marketeer to become a master in some aspect of those things. What we can do is say, what did I learn when I was doing that marketing that now I can distill and really understand in a way that, that others don't understand it and pass it on to the teams and the people that I'm working with in a way that allows them to perform in their, in their role at the stage they're at, whether they're a novice, you know, if, if you're coaching a novice, you want them to, 
to reach into practitionership as quickly as possible. And that's a different part of the learning curve from somebody who's, you know, moving from practitioner to expert or from expert to master. Um, so, you know, being conscious of where the other people are in your team and thinking about what do they need right now? How can I make it as simple as possible for them at that point? And that's that's the difference, I think, between a great player and a great coach. I've spent a lot of time looking at this, especially, as I say, because I come from sales, and, and it, it very rarely was. In fact, I can't think of any examples where the best salesperson then went on to become the best manager coach. In fact, they, they tended to be hampered because, because managers didn't ever want to lose them and thought, oh, I think you stay there. Uh, but also, they, they seem to do, as he's just said, unconsciously competent. They seem to do things intuitively. Um, whereas I was always, and I, I mean, I think I was quite a good salesperson, but, but I was never that hell bent on being the best. I was just interested in understanding what is it I can do to become better. Mm. Uh, and as you start to do that, you start to break it down, as you said, and understand the steps and the things that you do as opposed to, oh, yeah, you've got the gift of the gab. That's why you're great. Well, no, the specific things that lead to a, a, an out, a desired outcome that if I do it regularly and consistently, I always get to that point. Uh, and that's what I need to know. And that's how you can then teach others. So in, in terms of the writing of the book, I'm assuming that that writing of the book was almost part of your intentional mastery because you have to really understand <laughs> what you're doing to be able to write a book. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It was part of that whole journey for me of, you know, I know I'm I'm really quite good at these things. I wouldn't, you know, it's not for me to say whether I'm a master at them. It's for others to make that decision. But certainly, you know, I felt I was, I had some knowledge that was worthy of sharing with others. And the process of writing the book, which took me, you know, a couple of years and with a few false starts along the way, because I was researching, you know, is there any substance to what I'm saying here? Is the, is the anybody else talking about any part of this that makes sense? And some of it, you know, I couldn't find other people talking about it. So I had to double check with myself and with others that what I was saying was, right, that it was based on something meaningful and that others could use that information and make it meaningful for themselves as well. It was a big learning experience, but part of it was about that whole thing of making the unconscious conscious again so that I could play it out on bits of paper. And certainly in the early drafts, you know, I'd run those past um, friends and uh, tolerant uh, tolerant colleagues and they'd, uh, you know, they'd read it and go, well, I think what you're saying is quite good, but I don't really understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, you know, that was part of the editing process was to say, okay, so this part needs more work to simplify it, to make it more meaningful, to tell better stories, to give examples of, of that thing. And actually, I think that's another piece of mastery. I think most of the people who we would think of as masters of their game are good storytellers. They, you know, they can... They can tell a story in a way that makes it resonate with the listener or the, you know, the reader that allows them to see themselves in the story as well. And that's a skill that not everybody has by any means. It's a skill you can learn, but it's not one that everybody has learned. No, no, certainly not. And, um, yeah, I did actually have to do a podcast on storytelling as it happens again, because that is people who can tell stories. And if you look at any good business people, uh, and I'm talking about exceptional, who would describe you'd probably describe as masters. They do tell stories. They don't just give you facts. Which, yeah. uh, because we we are, you know, uh, by our very nature as human beings, you know, the, the things you remember from childhood, the stories your parents tell you, and there's a reason. <laughs> there's a reason for that. Um, so, in in terms of the book, so what if, if you were sort of like to say, um, if you read my book, you're going to get four or five key takeaways. There's probably more, but if there's four or five key takeaways, what would those be? What would be your story? What would what be the advert? <laughs> so, well, the book's in three sections. Section one is really about that journey to mastery and, and describing that and, and setting the context of what mastery is. The middle section is about the strategies that those businesses that I've seen being run by people who I would describe as masters of, of their art, the strategies that they follow, uh, and I'll come back to those in a moment. And section three is about mastering joy, because I think 
if you're going to master something, please, please master something that brings you pleasure and joy because otherwise uh, you're going to be spending a lot of time developing something that ultimately isn't going to be something you want to spend time on. So it's that connection back to purpose again, really. And just on that note, actually, because I, I mean, I've, I've only thought about, you know, do something you love and it, and it ceases to become work. And, and actually, you've got more chance of becoming a master at it, actually, because you, you love it so much. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you see many or any people who are masters at something that they don't really enjoy? I certainly see people who are expert at things that they don't enjoy. I, I, I can't think of any that I would say are masters. And again, I'm going to use a sports example here. I saw. Um, the rugby coach, Clive Woodward, uh, okay, yeah. who won the, the Rugby World Cup with the England team. And I saw him speak about his coaching and about his journey in coaching. See, there's another example of somebody who was, I mean, he would say, no, not much more than a practitioner of the sport when he yeah. played, but who went on to coach a World Cup winning team. And one of the things now that he's doing, now that he's no longer coaching, is he's working as you know, an, an executive consultant in larger businesses and helping them to learn some of the skills he learned as a as a coach and how to get teams to work effectively. So he's, he's kind of reinvented himself twice, but always focusing on what those experiences have brought him. And I think that's a sign of, of mastery. And I, I had the opportunity to speak to him and I said, you know, what do you really enjoy about your current role compared to the previous ones? And his answer, I thought, was really revealing. He said, it, it uses all of the skills that I learned in all of the other roles I've ever held. So it's not a replacement, it's a building on. So he really enjoyed playing rugby. He enjoyed coaching it even more because it used his playing skills as well as his what he was learning as a coach. And now he's a consultant and he's really enjoying that because it draws on all of those previous skills so there's you know there's a real connection still to the sport but there's also a real connection to what you have to do to become the very best yeah and that works across many fields so uh, you know i thought that was really revealing but i you know if he didn't enjoy doing that he wouldn't be doing it he doesn't you know he's i'm sure Given his history, he probably doesn't need to work uh, in terms of a financial reward. It's not about that. You know, his reward is not about the money. It's about what he sees other people achieving because of what he can teach them. Yeah, no, and, and there's something definitely very rewarding in that, I believe. Um, so, so in terms of in a business, when we talk about mastery, is that something that the leader needs to have, the whole business needs to have? individuals in the businesses how how does that that mastery translate into the, the building a better business well i think you've touched on something really important and that's that if a business is focused on helping to make all of the people that it is involved in it uh, whether they're you know sitting on the reception desk uh, answering the telephone or working with the highest powered client or leaders in government perhaps you know something that others would see as, you know, the really important part of the business. No, actually, every part of the business is important. And whilst, you know, there are different skills that you need to do different jobs, and some of those skills have a different value, uh, so, you know, people will get paid differently. I think if we can have a, a mindset that says, let's try to make everybody, you know, take move on that journey of mastery so that they become more masterful they're maybe not a master yet but if they're a novice if we help them to become a practitioner they are more masterful at what yeah so it's that you know mindset of thinking every day how can i help each person in the business to be a better deliverer of their part of the service or the product that they they provide become a better person themselves have more joy and more pleasure in the work they're doing, we're going to build a better business just by doing that, just by having that mindset. And thinking rather than thinking about what can I get out of this person, start thinking about what can I give this person so that they put more out themselves because they want to do it. That's how we build a, you know, a more human, a more real world uh, and a better business in the process. Everybody can win here. Excellent, thank you. And then just 
I was, I was just looking at that process. You said, so explorers, novices, practitioners, expert, mastery. People will be sitting there thinking, bloody hell, that's, that's 30 years of my life gone before I've become a master. If there, so, so, <laughs> is there anything you can do that you can fast track that mastery so you can go from a, an explorer or a novice to a master quite quickly? Because that's, a, you know, in, in this current day and age, you yeah. know, that's what everybody wants to do. I don't think there is a way in which you can skip any of the steps. So that's that's the first thing. I don't think you can be, you know, say, "Oh, I want to be a master pianist next week." Like, yeah. what, what can I do this week to make that happen? If you've never played a piano before, it's not going to happen, right? There, there are there are some yeah. elements of what we do. We just have to put the time in. But what we can do is accelerate the development along the way, and that that partly is about the intentionality piece. You know, if you if you really want to run at full speed and do this as quickly as you possibly can, then being really intentional, being really focused about, okay, what are the next steps? That can accelerate it. The second thing is to find and surround yourself with the people who've got the knowledge, skills, and experience you need to help you on that journey. I don't think we can become masters by locking ourselves into a room and reading business books or even sadly, you know, listening to podcasts like this one. We, we need we need to be working with people that can really help us get the skill we need, but also to deal with the, you know, there's a whole big piece of this that is about us as individuals. So there's, you know, we need support and help to be more mentally uh, resilient, to be emotionally uh, aware, be physically you know be physically strong as well you know if you're going to go on a long journey and this is a long journey then you need to be physically fit otherwise it's going to be harder work and i don't know you know you look at the really successful businesses and people will have their own view that something somebody will have popped into their head they may think tesla is really successful you know elon musk Branson, whatever. But you look at those people. They are physically well. They look after themselves mentally. Yeah. They spend time making sure that they are in the best health they can be. And as a result, they're able to put their energy into the business and into developing themselves as a master. So for me, that's the biggest single mistake people make in business is they take their eye off the fact that they, as an individual, as a, as a human being, need to be looked after too. Okay, thanks. And then, and then, one of the things um, that you know you say that you do, and we, we said it at the in um, in the intro, is about trying to improve the outcomes of decisions uh, so that you're making the right decisions. So, how how can you increase the likelihood that you're making effective decisions? Number of little techniques. I mean, the first is to, when you make decisions, what, what information are you using to help inform you before you make that decision? And, uh, you know, one of the things I learned along the way was my decision making was based on what I knew at the time, but I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about what I didn't know before I made a decision. So I was basing it on a, what you know, nearly always we work with imperfect information. It's very rare that you have, you know, absolutely everything about a decision. We've got unknowns, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about what are the unknowns? What are the things I don't know? I'm, you know, I'm about, I'm about to ask somebody to marry me tomorrow. No, I'm, this is hypothetical, just to be clear. <laughs> uh, I'm about to ask somebody to marry me tomorrow. What, what do I not know about that person? And, you know, how many of us actually asked that question before we got engaged? I don't know, but I know that I didn't, and that's okay. But if you want to make a better decision, start thinking about what are the other things you don't know. Also think about what am I assuming is true, mm. and do I know it's true? So we can, you know, we've maybe been offered a bit of business from a, a new client that we know nothing about. We might assume that they're going to be good payers because they, they, we like them and they feel like you know they'll pay on time. We do some work with them and then we find actually they don't pay on time at all. They haggle and argue and pay 60, 90, 120 days after the work's done. What did we assume at the time? And what could we have done to have checked that assumption? You know, So we start using decisions that don't turn out as well as we would like to inform 
the decisions that we're taking today and, and learning from them. And that a lot of that is about documenting the basis on which you made the decision and then reflecting back on it. There is one other important point, you know, that a really good decision doesn't necessarily have a good outcome. So the, the example I'd use here to express that is if we were to go to the horse racing and decide we're just going to bet on horse number one in every race, we'd win sometimes, right? And we'd, we'd lose other times because horse number one might win or it might not. But would the decision to bet on horse number one have been a good one the times it won and a bad one the times it didn't? Or was it the quality of that decision, good or bad, always? And I, you know, I would say that that's a, you know, to, to use, to base your decision on only one piece of information, the number of the horse is not going to be a good decision in any world, even when it wins. Yeah. And I'm not advocating gambling either. I'm not, I'm just using it as an example. So some, some good decisions will have a poor outcome because events and things we hadn't been able to consider will can conspire against us. So one thing when things don't work out and you go, okay, so I've taken on this client that's paying me late. Was the quality of that decision better or worse than others that I've taken? Have I just been unlucky this time, in other words? Um, or actually, did I was I kind of hoodwinked a bit because I really liked them and I really wanted to work with them and they really you know were a good fit with what we do? And maybe I just looked through those tinted spectacles, in which case that was a poorer decision and we should learn from it and make sure that we test our assumptions next time. So yeah, it's it's a, again it's a process. You know, making good decisions is a process, and part of it is about thinking them through afterwards and documenting what was the basis of them, so that you can reflect and go, okay, next time I'm going to do this. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's very very good advice actually, uh, because I think a lot of people don't reflect uh, on the decisions that they make, and therefore they either are doomed to repeat the failures of the past. Or they've made a great decision and they've done it because of the process, but they've not reflected on it. So they don't make a decision uh, mm. like that again. I am a kind of obsessive about process, processes in everything. I'm always looking for patterns. And when I see something, I, I think it comes from my gaming um, background uh, when, I, when I was very young. I used, whenever I was playing computer games, as they were then, uh, not video games or whatever they call them these days, I was always looking, well, hang on. So what is it I'm doing here that's getting me across that bridge? And then what is it I'm not doing when I fall into the water, et cetera? So you, you, don't, you start to build patterns. So I've, all, I've always been like that in everything I do, to be honest. So in terms of that then, so where have you seen it where you've got people who are consistently making good decisions? And is that always because it's intentional? It's not always because it's intentional. You know, there is an element, as I say, we're, we're usually working with imperfect information. It's usually... Yeah we're missing when we make a decision so sometimes those will work in our favor and sometimes they'll work against us we could call that luck i think it's 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 just the way that the world works so we've got to accept that it's there um i think there are people who get away with making poorer decisions a lot of the time and they get away with it generally because they're agile they can react quickly when things go wrong. They've got that skill. So a lot of it also then depends on what skills have we got. Are we, we may make decisions quickly on limited information. We may even make lots of poor decisions. But if we're observant, we're watching and we're looking for the outcomes of those decisions, then we're likely to spot that they weren't a good decision early and do something about it and make a change. There are other people who deliberate a lot on decisions, make the decision, and then don't do a lot to validate that it was a good decision. They assume they've made a good decision. They let things run for quite a long yeah. time. And then all of a sudden they wake up one morning and go, oh, what happened? I haven't got any clients left um, <laughs> because of a decision they took some time ago. And they're not agile and they're not quick at making the decision. So I think you know, your listeners need to think hard about what kind of person are they? Are they you know, fast twitch is, you know, like muscles. Yeah. And quick decisions, but monitoring them and looking looking to see what the results are. Or are they 
more slow, more deliberating, wanting to make the best decision and, and wanting that decision then to be able to, to just run. And depending which you are, you need to think about, well, what, what do I need to change to make this a better outcome for me? If I'm making fast decisions on limited information, maybe slowing down a bit would be a better strategy. Just a bit, not saying slow right down to the pace of the very slow people, but slow down a bit, think about what other information you could get, make slightly better decisions so that you're not firefighting some of the time. And for the people who make slow, deliberate decisions, you know, there might be a benefit in speeding up and recognizing that sometimes there will be mistakes, so you need to trap for them. You need to be looking out for them. And then you can make, you know, that optimum, I think, is where you make, you're not held up by making decisions that are taking too long. And you're also not making decisions too fast so that you make mistakes, you know, too many mistakes along the way. There's a sweet spot somewhere. You'll still make a few mistakes. You'll still maybe take longer than some people would like to make decisions. But there is that sweet spot where you're making decisions reasonably quickly and reasonably well. And how does, would you say that contingency planning plays into both that aspect and also building a better business? Because whoever you are, things just don't always go according to plan, do they? No, they don't. And I, you know, my insurance history taught me that the power of, of doing some risk analysis uh, on businesses, and I still do that, I do it in my own business, and I do it with and for clients, just to think through what are the things that could really throw you off course? And what are we going to do uh, to manage those? You know, if you're in property at the moment, rising interest rates, if you weren't, if you didn't have a contingency for that, you might be looking at your prospective mortgage repayments and thinking, well, this is a bit of a problem right now because, oh, yeah. you know, we've gone from 0.1 of a percent to four and a quarter percent in what, less than a year. So that kind of thinking about where are the big, big risks that could throw my business right off course and what am I going to do if they turn up and just having some planning around that. You know, so I know property businesses that I work with who you know, looking now, you know, with interest rates much higher, that some of them are sitting, feeling probably a little bit smug, probably, you know, that they, they're they locked into longer term fixed rate deals two or three years ago, uh, whereas others who are on short term deals probably getting a lower rate than they were a couple of years ago, but now facing big, big increases in repayments on, you know, property portfolios that, that can run into you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds extra in, in debt repayments over the course of a year. That's not trivial. So, you know, the ones that had the contingency plan and were thinking ahead about how they managed that risk probably didn't make as much money two or three years ago, making more money now over the course yeah. of five years. You know, they may be doing better um, than, than the others. So, Thinking about that, I think it's really important. You don't need to look at every possible thing that could go wrong. You need just to look at the things that, if they go wrong, would be you know, a real problem for the business. On top of that list, come back to this, you know, the business owner, your health uh, is one of those things. So you know, make sure you've got insurance in place to protect you if you are unfortunately taken ill because that could happen. We all hope it doesn't. You know, you know, we were talking before, and my partner's had quite a serious back operation recently. That kind of came out of the blue in a relatively short period of time. So, you know, those things, and she runs her own business as well. So we can, we can be faced with something quite significant quite quickly. We, but if you've got plans for it, it's not that big an issue. Yeah, no, I think, I think it is interesting, actually. I mean... I don't. I don't often quote this particular individual, Joey Barton. Uh, I, I did. I did read his book. Very interesting book, to say the least. Very character, if ever there was one. Eh? Yes, exactly. Uh, and the one thing, the one thing. I mean, he, he said quite a few interesting things. Actually, the one thing that, he, that really resonated with me is he said that people always talk about a, a plan A and a plan B, but there's 26 le letters in the alphabet, uh, which I thought was quite. Um, a nice way of saying that, you know, you should have several contingency plans and not just say, oh, well, if this doesn't happen, I'll do this. And then that's it. That really resonated because I think lots of people do run into things without even having plan B, never mind plan C and plan D. And I think that can be very, very challenging. 
as businesses are guaranteed to hit bumps along the road. And if you haven't got any sort of continuity in place, it can actually <laughs> take you out of that business, actually, yeah. in, in some but, circumstances. And, and some of those things will be within our control. Uh, you know, and some of them will be completely outside our control. You know, the 2008 banking crisis, yeah. I don't think many people saw that coming, but a you know, worldwide recession had a massive impact on many, many businesses. And then, you know, 2020, suddenly we've got a pandemic. And, and again, that's nobody could control that. But there are businesses that have thrived through that time uh, and businesses that have, you know, struggled and some who've died, especially in the events and and uh, entertainment arenas it's been a really really tough time for that sector but even there there are examples of people who had the right contingencies in place and have, have you know thrived through it maybe not thrived but at least survived and are now thriving at the other side of it you know, so obviously we, we, we're going through you know trying to get from being an explorer to a master you're giving us some ideas of how to do that um, you know, in terms of, and also in terms of accelerating development. So, if there are situations, well, I know the situations. So, people are doing what they consider to the right things. They've read your book, for example. They try to go through the process, and they're still not delivering. What, what, what would you say? What they would need to do in those circumstances, and what would be the common things that you'd see that are the reasons why people don't get to be masters and then build a better business? I think a lot of the time when people have got a business that isn't doing very well, they get wrapped up in the tactics of what they're doing. They get wrapped up into what do I need to do today and what do I need to do this morning and, oh, blimey, you know, there's not enough money in the bank. I need to move some money back. All those little things that, that take up all our time. Stop just having a moment to pause and step back and say, okay, strategically, what do I need to do? What's, what's actually wrong with this business right now that I can fix if I put some focus on it. That's why the middle section of the book is really focused on strategies, five key strategies that I think every business has to get right. Sales, um, the systems, you know, you, you said you love process and, and when we have good process, we get much better consistency in the business. The skills within the business, so making sure you've got the right skills and developing those with the people. We've talked about that. Signposting, marketing, but also all other communications with existing clients, with, with your team, making sure you've got everything well signposted. Those four are very much about the business. And we've talked a lot about the fifth one, which is yourself, and making sure that you've got a strategy for your own health and well-being. So those five strategies, I think, are, are key. and. Uh, having a real view of where do I want where do I want the business to be in five years in a year year's time on each of those areas. So I think the ideal for most businesses is sales is consistent, steady, the right level for the business at that point in its development, and that you understand how to go and make sales and to get more business when you need it. And that's. You know, that is about being strategic around how you uh, operate rather than that whole tactical firefighting. This has gone wrong. That's gone wrong. Now I need to put that fire out. Never get time to think about strategy. But if you don't get time to think about strategy, you don't have one. And that, that becomes your only strategy. You know, the strategy of businesses that are firefighting is we don't have a strategy. We're just firefighting. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's not the way to build a better business. So as taking some time out, work with you know your team internally, yes, but maybe get some external people, somebody like me or somebody like you who can come in from the outside, not emotionally attached to it in the same way, and can see you know where there are places to, to make a difference. And, and, and do you have any just quick tips on how to – because strategy is one of the areas where I see people really struggle – and in in terms of quick tips on how you make it a living breathing strategy because we've all seen these weighty tomes uh of strategic documents that go in go, go into a top drawer and come out when your boss or or you, you want to have a meeting with somebody and you you pull it out of the drawer dust it off and then say, oh yes can't you remember the strategy yeah how, yeah how do you make it a living breathing thing uh, so the first thing is to keep it really simple you know if you can't express what you're 
vision for your businesses in a way that somebody who knows nothing about that market can understand in a sentence or two you're not you're not telling us you not haven't got a place to go to so no strategy will get you there you know <laughs> yeah. if you're on the road to nowhere then nowhere is where you'll get to yeah so that you know simplifying it uh, making it something that people will say i understand that that's the first step the second step i think then is making people who understand it want to say actually i want to be part of that i want to help you because that's important and that's meaningful to me and this is why i thought you know the the training company i mentioned earlier that's building floating classrooms in bangladesh and you know for that vision of sharing knowledge yes they're a training company so of course they share knowledge but sharing knowledge with people who can't get it any other way uh suddenly makes it very real it's a story um we've talked about storytelling too so you know tell the story of what your business is going to become uh, in a way that people go i want to help you with that then you've got once you've got that vision building a strategy behind that becomes really easy because it, you start then saying okay does this help us to achieve that vision you know so imagine you know that you wanted to be the first person to row across the atlantic so you paint that story you know i want to be the first person that rows across the atlantic everything about the strategy from that point on is easy does this boat will this boat get across the atlantic in one piece yes or no no right we need another design am i going to be physically strong enough to row for the 30 days that it takes to row across it no right i need to do something about my fitness you know so the the strategies become obvious when you have that clear vision so start there yeah no i think that very good good advice actually and and the penultimate question you talked a lot about obviously development and you know accelerating mastery and, and and actually learning so if if you were to look back at your younger self what's the one piece of advice you'd give to that younger self which would get you to be a master quicker than maybe you 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 got there in reality it all boils down really to one thing which is take yourself a bit less seriously <laughs> yeah um, you know we're we're once you realize that this is a you know something that is going to take some time probably a lifetime you know i i suspect that i will be more masterful next year than i am this and i will be more masterful than that a year after that then i'm accepting in that moment that i'm not yet complete that i don't know everything that i haven't honed the skills to the best that i can make them and that i haven't got all the experience that i need so I'm just going to keep learning. I'm going to keep doing those things to build that. And when you take yourself seriously, you're really kind of locking yourself into where you are right now. When you take yourself a little bit less seriously, you can let go of that and say, "Okay, so that wasn't perfect. Or well, that didn't go as well as I expected." And it's not that all-consuming kind of failure thing. It becomes one of, "Okay, that's happened." I'll deal with that. Um so I'm just a work in progress these days and I wish I'd realized that when I was much younger because I'd be much further on if I had. Oh. So <laughs> it's just take yourself take yourself with a pinch of salt and recognize that you're going to be learning for the rest of your life and then it gets a lot easier. Thank you. And then my last question which may well have been <laughs> answered by that one is you know people are watching this and if there's one thing that you were to say all right what if you don't do anything else and you take one piece of advice that I've, that I've mentioned and obviously there's been lots what would that be uh focus on the 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 area that is the overlap between what you can can do and enjoy and what you think is really important in the world you know those where you can find the overlaps where something that you're doing is making a difference that goes beyond you and you focus on that and master that overlap then your business will fly you'll fly you'll feel more satisfied more complete and you've made a massive step on this journey to mastery thank you very much uh william buse is really um been uh, well i can't 55 minutes have flown by 
I feel like I've only just started, but I really appreciate your time. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I'm pretty positive that if people take your advice, they're going to be certainly on a step to closer to getting to mastery. But as you said, don't take yourself too seriously and understand that you are on a learning journey. And I'll put obviously links to your book, etc., in the podcast description. But thank you very much for your time today. It's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, if, if people would like to get the book, it's you can get it on Amazon. It's on Audible as well and on Kindle. So you can listen to me for hours, if you wish, by <laughs> recording of it. Um, and I've got that lovely, unusual surname, uh, Bust, that means I'm relatively easy to find. The website is williambuse.com. So Excellent. I'd look forward to connecting with anybody that wants to connect. Thank you, William. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Hakeem. It's been a fabulous conversation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. So that's another 55 minutes, which has just flown by with William Bust. I'm sure you found that as engaging and informative as I did. And the key thing that really jumped out to me was, you know, he talked about, William talked about the key areas to focus on if you want to be strategic and you want to move your business on and you want to build a better business. And what I really like was he talked about the sales. We all know about the sales. The systems, we probably all know about the systems, don't always employ them. Um, We talked about the skills, which are obviously important as well. And they talked about the signposting, you know, talking about signposting, communication and everything else. But one thing he talked about, the fifth element, which I don't think many people talk about, was making sure that you're focusing on yourself as well and me. I thought that was really insightful. I found that very interesting. It's definitely something I'm going to take away. So I'm sure you found that really, really informative. And all of the information that we discussed, you can find in the podcast description. And don't forget to check out the show notes at www.thesalesaccelerationformula.com. And as always, subscribe, like, and share with your friends, colleagues, and anyone else who you think may be interested. But most of all, keep the feedback coming so that we can continue to improve and give you more of what you like. Hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And as I always do, keep listening and keep growing. 